Turn your Bibles to Jeremiah chapter 20. Jeremiah chapter 20, we continue to walk through sacred history, going from eternity to eternity. And we looked at Isaiah last week, which brought us essentially to the end of the northern kingdom of Israel. Tonight we turn our attention to Jeremiah. We fast forward about 100 years to the end of the southern kingdom of Judah. Jeremiah chapter 20. Beginning in verse 1, hear now the word of the true and living God. Now Pasher the priest, son of Immer, who was chief officer in the house of Yahweh, heard Jeremiah prophesying these things. Then Pasher beat Jeremiah the prophet, put him in stocks that were in the upper Benjamin gate of the house of Yahweh. The next day, when Pasher released Jeremiah from the stocks, Jeremiah said to him, Yahweh does not call your name Pasher, but terror on every side. For, this, uh, for thus says Yahweh, Behold, I will make you a terror to yourself and to all your friends. They shall fall by the sword of their enemies while you look on. Into the hand of the king of Babylon, he shall carry them captive to Babylon and shall strike them down with the sword. Moreover, I will give all the wealth of the city, all its gains, all its prized belongings, and all the treasures of the kings of Judah into the hand of their enemies, who shall plunder them and seize them and carry them to Babylon. And you, Pasher, and all who dwell in your house shall go into captivity. To Babylon you shall go, and there you shall die, and there you shall be buried, you and all your friends, to whom you have prophesied falsely. O Yahweh, you deceived me, and I was deceived. You are stronger than I, and you have prevailed. I have become a laughing stock all the day. Everyone mocks me. For whenever I speak, I cry out, I shout, violence and destruction. For the word of Yahweh has become for me a reproach and derision all day long. If I say, I will not mention him or speak any more in his name, there is in my heart, as it were, a burning fire shut up in my bones, and I cannot, I am weary with holding it in. Indeed, I cannot. For I hear many whispering, terror is on every side. Denounce him. Let us denounce him, say all my close friends, watching for my fall. Perhaps he will be deceived. Then we can overcome him and take our revenge on him. But Yahweh is with me as a dread warrior. Therefore, my persecutors will stumble. They will not overcome me. They will be greatly shamed, for they will not succeed. Their eternal dishonor will never be forgotten. O Yahweh of hosts, who tests the righteous, who sees the heart and the mind, let me see your vengeance upon them. For to you I have committed my cause. Sing to Yahweh. Hallelujah. For He has delivered the life of the needy from the hand of evildoers. Cursed be the day on which I was born, the day when my mother bore me. Let it not be blessed. Cursed be the man who brought the news to my father. A son is born to you, making him very glad. Let that man be like the cities that Yahweh overthrew without pity. Let him hear a cry in the morning and an alarm at noon. Because he did not kill me in the womb, so my mother would have been my grave and her womb forever great. Why did I come out from the womb to see toil and sorrow and spend my days in shame? Let us pray. Lord God, as we turn our attention to one of, one of your spokespeople, one of the prophets, Jeremiah, and as we see the times in which he lived and the message that he brought to your people, may we see what it means for us today and how we may live in accordance with your word. We pray through Christ our Lord. Amen. Jeremiah was a prophet in Judah, in the southern kingdom. 
He prophesied from approximately 627 B.C. to just after the destruction of Jerusalem in about 587 or 86 B.C. It depends on who you ask. His message was a simple one. Babylon is coming. Exile is coming. Judgment is coming. But there was a ray of hope to his simple message. God will bring His people back from exile. Salvation and redemption will come. There will be a new covenant brought on because of a new exodus. In some ways, Jeremiah's task was not unlike Isaiah. He was to announce God's judgment upon God's people while holding out the promise of redemption and salvation. I believe it's safe to assume that both Isaiah and Jeremiah took no pleasure in their work of telling and foretelling of God's strange work, as they called it, wherein He would bring His people into judgment and bring destruction upon them. I don't think they took any pleasure in that. However, where they differ is that Jeremiah was one who did wear his emotions on his sleeve. The heartbreak that he feels, the tears that he sheds, come across in the pages that we read. And this is why he is called the weeping prophet. Isaiah, very good at uh, kind of separating the prophet from the message. Jeremiah, he's all wrapped up in it. And he had reason to weep. You look at the condition of the people in Jeremiah's day. It was They were a... A motley crew. It was a sore sight. In a word, the people were so corrupt they could do no good. They were unable to hear God's Word. Back in chapter 6 and verse 10, we were told their ears are uncircumcised. They cannot listen. They had hearts to match their ears. We are told in 9 and verse 26, all the house of Israel are uncircumcised in heart. The people are so accustomed to evil that like the Ethiopian who cannot change his skin or the leopard who cannot change his spots, so Israel could not change. Their hearts were desperately sick. And like Isaiah a century before, <clears throat> Jeremiah is commissioned by God. <coughs> Excuse me. Jeremiah is commissioned by God. We read about this commission in chapter 1, but in chapter 7 and verse 27, we read these words. So you shall speak all these words to them, but they will not listen to you. That's eerily similar to what Isaiah was told by God in Isaiah chapter 6. You shall call to them, and will not answer. Jeremiah is told in chapter 8 and verse 9, they have rejected the word of Yahweh. They have forsaken my law, says Yahweh in chapter 9 and verse 13. There's no wisdom in them. And so each one determines to act according to the stubbornness of his own evil heart. Chapter 18 and verse 12. This is the situation into which Jeremiah is a prophet. He steps under the grand stage of human history and this is what he is met by when he's surrounded by his own people. It's not unlike what, uh, well, this, this is, I, I was involved in a conversation this afternoon uh, with some seasoned veterans of the faith who, once again, we were all impressed with just how contemporary the Word of God is. Even though the last issuance of divine utterance took place nearly 2,000 years ago, this is as relevant as tomorrow. Because we re read this and, and they cannot listen and they, they won't listen and they, even though they're called, they're not going to hear. And, and they have the truth of God's Word, but they suppress that truth in unrighteousness and so dead in their trespasses and sins that it's just it's not getting through. They have hearts of stone. And while that was true of Jeremiah's day, well, the more things change, the more they stay the same. There are still many people whose ears are uncircumcised, whose hearts are uncircumcised, who are so accustomed to evil, they don't want to change. And indeed, they cannot change. This is Jeremiah's predicament as he brings the Word of God to the people of God. Now we read 
Jeremiah chapter 20. And this is kind of the way things go for Jeremiah. You have these narratives that, are, that, that uh, show up throughout Jeremiah. And here's one where you have a priest. You have priest on priest violence. All right, Jeremiah was uh, a priest. And here's Pasher, a priest. Uh, he is a chief officer in the temple, the house of Yahweh. And, uh, you know, he, he doesn't like what Jeremiah is saying. And so Pasher, ha he throws a beating Jeremiah's way, throws Jeremiah in the stocks overnight. And once that's done, uh, Jeremiah has a word for him. He says, you're, you're not Pasher, you're terror on every side. And uh, guess what? Uh, you're going into captivity. Everyone you love is going into captivity. You're going to die there. You're going to be buried there, you and all your friends. Oof. And then you get lament. Uh, I think we can kind of identify with Jeremiah in terms of God's going to get you and everyone you love. Especially when people are doing violence to us and, and, and hurting us and mocking us and laughing derisively at us. I think we, we can get behind that, but it's the part that comes after. Again, this is why we know this task brought Jeremiah no joy, no pleasure. Because he turns right around in verse 7 here, and he laments. He opens up his heart to God in prayer. And that's what this is. And he expresses the depths of his emotion. Oh, Yahweh! My text says, you deceived me. The idea here is, is that of, well, to some degree, yes, you tricked me, but you allured me. And I was allured. You enticed me. And I was enticed. Was he deceived? Well, close reading of the book shows that God had told him, people are going to fight against you. They're going to fight against you. They're not going to listen. We've already seen that. They can't listen to their uncircumcised ears. So in one sense, no, but in another sense, that's what Jeremiah feels. That's the real raw emotion that he experiences, right? It, it culminates in that uh, imprecation even upon the day of his birth. That one is, I mean, I don't know about you, but that just slaps me right across the face. Like, oh man, it's kind of like... A, you know, I, you see these uh, news articles that uh, come across the line now and again. And um, I remember one here not too long ago. You know, when someone gets to the milestone of where they're like 110 or 115, some news journalist is sent to their house in order to interview them. And what's the secret for longevity? I remember one. Imagine this with your grandma, right? And your here's grandma. Grandma, what's the secret of your longevity? And hers was, uh, well, I drink a beer every day. <laughs> like, grandma, you know? What? And that's kind of what it's like when I read Cursed uh, Be the Day on which I was born. Like, Jeremiah, what? No, man, come on, you know? But again, this is the real raw emotion, and this is what we are, what we are accustomed to in Scripture. Uh, God, in His Word, holds nothing back. And, and so here is Jeremiah, like, curse the day I was born. Curse the guy who brought the news, right? Like, man, Jeremiah... Again, that's, that's what he's experienced. That's what he feels in the moment after he's just had a beating thrown his way and spent a night in stocks for faithfully telling the Word of God. I was deceived. And then notice here in verse 7, you have prevailed, Jeremiah says. Yahweh prevailed over Jeremiah. Why? You're stronger than I, he says. This is... That is, God is stronger than Jeremiah, and he recognizes that readily. This is Jeremiah's theology. It keeps God. He keeps God in the proper perspective. You're stronger than me. And, and this is why uh, you read earlier in chapter 10, verse 23, where Jeremiah says, I know, O Yahweh, that the way of man is not in himself, that it is not in man who walks to direct his steps. Then who does that? Yahweh. Humans plan and plan, and it's God who directs the way, every step of the way. That's how big God was to Jeremiah. How big is God to you? We'll circle back to that. The people, I've become a laughing stock all day. Just this incessant, mocking, derisive laughter. That's what Jeremiah has become. And uh, he's deeply offended, it seems, that he's kind of become this laughing stock. Nobody's taking him seriously. Really, God? This is this is what I'm supposed to do here? No one takes me seriously? They're just going to heap 
uh, reproach and derision all day long. The end of verse 8. They're not going to listen. I speak. I cry out. I'm shouting at the top of my lungs. Violence. Destruction. That's what's coming. No one's listening. And they just laugh. In a couple weeks, we'll look at the book of Ezekiel. He had a similar problem. And in fact, God told him, they're going to show up at church every Sunday and they're just going to think like you're one who sings a song. Oh, that was a nice song. Even though you're prophesying destruction and devastation. and If the verbal abuse wasn't enough, again, you had the physical abuse. He'd just been beaten and thrown in the stocks. i got to believe Jeremiah wished that he could just preach one sermon of encouragement, right? Just one, God, just one sermon on Your grace, on Your mercy, and yet... He's been commissioned to cry out and shout about violence and destruction. And it seems to have taken its toll. And so in verse 9, it looks like he, he came to a point where he's considering like, yeah, I'm, just gonna, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. I don't like this job, and I'm going to go do something else. And he considered throwing in the towel. But notice, he's verse 9, if I say, I'm not going to mention him, and I'm not going to speak any more in his name, I'm just going to hold it in, well, there's within my bones, as it were, uh, burning fire shut up. And I'm weary. I, I, just, I can't do it. I cannot hold it in. Um, he concluded with the fire in his bones, which is the name of God. It's the, the Word of God. It can't be contained in his heart. It can't be shut up in his bones. And so he presses on with his prophetic task. I think, I believe we can identify with this, right? Week in and week out. Uh, the, the Word of God is proclaimed from this pulpit. And, and maybe you're diligent in sharing the Gospel with others. I mean, it, part of the Gospel is there's bad news, right? But we do have a message of hope that we hold out to people. And yet, what do we get for it, Right? And maybe we get to the point where it's like, what's the use? I'm, I'm not going to do it anymore. We can learn a lot from Jeremiah in pressing on in the prophetic task. Pressing on in the evangelistic task. We can't keep it to ourselves. We can't contain it. It's a fire in our bones. It's the nature of the Word of God. Even his close friends uh, in verse 10, right? Denounce Him. Let us denounce Him. That's what they're whispering, right? Uh, so they say, all my close friends, even they're plotting on him. They're watching to see if he's going to fall, whispering their clandestine plots against him. And so you had this imprecatory psalm uh, or imprecatory word here where Jeremiah, he calls for God to take vengeance on his enemies. Let me see your vengeance upon them, for to you I have committed my cause. And notice how he sees Yahweh. Verse 11, Yahweh is with me. So you have the, the, the presence, the abiding presence of God. Yahweh is with me, but notice, as a dread warrior. Or uh, the, uh, there's a new version called the Legacy Standard Bible that's out. It says, as a ruthless warrior. Um, that's how Jeremiah saw God who was with him. One more very important aspect of the book of Jeremiah that we would be remiss if we neglected it, is in chapter 31. Because this is a text, verses 31 to 34, which is quoted at length by the writer of Hebrews. In fact, it is the longest quotation of the Old Testament in the New Testament. In Hebrews chapter 8, the writer of Hebrews quoted it there. And here we have the favorite uh, moniker that is used by the New Testament authors, the New Covenant, and yet, it's, this is the only place that it's used in the Old Testament. Very interesting. It's only used here in Jeremiah 31, 31. And yet, that's the term, New Covenant, that is used, the phrase that's used again and again in the New Testament to describe the New Covenant that Jesus brings forth in His blood. Now, to properly understand the New Covenant that God is going to make with the house of Israel, the house of Judah, and uh, it's not going to be a covenant like the one that I made with their fathers on the day that I brought them took them by the hand, brought them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. In order to understand this, we need to dive back, way back in Jeremiah, to chapter 3 and verse 16. A very interesting 
statement is made in Jeremiah 3 and verse 16. The text says, And when you have multiplied and increased in the land in those days, declares Yahweh, they shall no more say, The Ark of the Covenant of Yahweh, it shall not come to mind, or be remembered, or missed. It shall not be made again. Now, this would have been stunning news and uh, perhaps a bit disturbing to the people of God. I mean, the Ark of the Covenant, that was, that was where the smoky Shekinah presence of God abided. And, and here we're saying, it's going away? Not to mention, inside the Ark, that's where you contain the law. And, and now uh, we're being told that there's coming this future time, that whole thing's going to be unnecessary. Well, why is that? Jeremiah 31 is the answer to that, uh, where you have this new covenant that's coming, and instead of God's law being in a, gold, a golden-covered uh, wood box, now His law is going to be written on people's hearts. Uh, and, and that's where it's going to be. And we're told in 3 and verse 17, well, the people, the nations are no longer going to follow after their stubborn, evil hearts. Uh, and, and in fact, they're going to be gathered to Jerusalem where Yahweh rules. Well, how's that going to happen? Because God is going to be the one who does the heart surgery. Takes out the heart of stone, puts it in the heart of flesh, and then writes His law on those fleshy hearts. And uh, all of that is here prophesied. Notice as we come back to Jeremiah 31, verse 33, But this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after these days, declares Yahweh. I will put My, my Torah my law, my instruction within them. I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. That's a, that's a typical phrase for covenant. Typical covenantal language. I will be their God, they shall be my people. You see that again and again. So you have covenant members now who are going to be faithful to God's law. They're going to be faithful to God's instruction. They're going to follow Him with a new whole heart. And uh, Yahweh's people, they're going to be His people, and He will be their God. So, New Covenant, very important, very key, and we'll discuss that more in a moment. One of the themes that we've been tracking with as we've been going along, of course, is God's glory in salvation through judgment. We see in Jeremiah, judgment, it's unavoidable. God will bring Judah into exile. Jeremiah predicts that the coming Babylonians are going to take the people of God into captivity. And God, He's going to stir up the north. Nebuchadnezzar, the king of the Babylonians, is going to come down and He's going to wage war and lay siege and destroy the land and its inhabitants. And God's people are going to serve in Babylon for 70 years. Jeremiah 25 gives us the time stamp of 70 years. Uh, seems to be what da Daniel was studying uh, as he was in exile over in uh, what chapter 9 of Daniel. So judgment's coming, but salvation is coming too. Not merely a return to the promised land after 70 years, but also this new covenant that God is going to make. He's going to cut with His people. And God Himself will produce the people who will be eager to fulfill the law of God because it will be written on their hearts and in their minds. But with the coming of the new covenant, there will also be blessing for all of humanity to the Jews first, house of Israel, house of Judah. But then the nations are going to come and gather at the, at the, the throne of Yahweh in Jerusalem. And, and the nations, they're going to glory in Yahweh, chapter 4, verse 2 says. So in all this, notice, God will be glorified in salvation through judgment. Got to go through the exile. But there's coming this new covenant and it's going to bring salvation for all people. So what does Jeremiah have to teach us today? Much in many ways. Uh, first is the faithfulness in announcing judgment to those who are under the wrath of God. I want you to imagine for just a moment that every Sunday you came to worship, week in and week out, you came faithfully every Sunday, and every sermon that I preached was about God's judgment. And I just kept hammering away, and ham God's wrath on sin, God's judgment. That was Jeremiah's church, <laughs> right? That was, that was what you got, a steady diet of judgment's coming, judgment's coming, exile, exile, and all that. Now, you know, I, every Sunday, I don't, of course, preach on those themes, but 
in order to be faithful to the task of making known the full counsel of God to the people of God, there are times when we do camp on those subjects. And judgment and wrath and all that, those are Bible subjects, so we deal with them as they come. But again, it's, it's time to time. And so when, uh, when we do that, it's, it's part of the whole counsel of God. But fortunately, right, we get to camp on grace. We did that for a few weeks here just recently, right? And, but here's the thing. It should be noted that when, when I do preach on those things and when we do talk about God's judgment, I'm, I stand on the rich prophetic heritage here of Isaiah and Jeremiah. I don't take any pleasure in doing that. Uh, I don't stand up here and just, you know, with a great big grin and say, ah, God's judgment's coming on all you sinners, right? I mean, that would be ridiculous, right? It's a dreadful thing to fall under the wrath of God. It is a fearful thing. Our God is a consuming fire, right? And so I, I stand on that heritage, and I think at the same time, whenever we do talk to people about the judgment of God and the wrath of God, we should not do it with a Cheshire Cat grin. It's a sobering thing, and we ought to bring it with all humility. But it is essential that the truth of God's settled disposition towards sin, which is wrath, it is essential that we make that known to all people. And Jeremiah was faithful in doing that, and we too need to be faithful in doing that also. I asked the question earlier when we saw Jeremiah's theology, you're stronger than I, how big is God to you? How big is God to you? Is God stronger than you? And I don't mean that we just do lip service, but can we really agree with Jeremiah? Can you agree with Jeremiah in saying to God, you are stronger than I? Um, and then, when we're laughed to scorn and mocked for our commitment to the truth of God, how do we see God? For Jeremiah, he's a dread warrior, a ruthless warrior, coming to my defense. And it's not because God is coming to my side. I have aligned myself with God. I, he has His side, and, and I need to come under that and line up with it. And, and that's the only way that God will be a dread warrior in defense of me. Same thing is true for us today. Uh, how, do we, how do we see God? How big is God to us? Those are important questions that Jeremiah confronts us with. There's one episode in Jeremiah that is rather interesting, and I, I think it's appropriate for the times in which we live. It's actually in Jeremiah 36. We take it for granted that we can just print off books and pages, no problem, right? Uh, you know, we, we have, a, we have a, a copier here at the building, and I make uh, copies from time to time. And I mean, we could just, I, I've got books galore. I just got some new books today, um, which was exciting. <laughs> Always exciting in the Prez house when I get new books. But um, at least it is for me. We take for granted just how rapidly we can produce text. In their day, they didn't have kinkos, they didn't have copiers. It was all done by hand. Jeremiah, fortunately, had a scribe. His name was Baruch. And Jeremiah and Baruch, they were tight. And so Baruch would take dictation at Jeremiah, uh, at Jeremiah's uh, uh, word. As Jeremiah was saying things, Baruch would write it down. So Baruch uh, produces this scroll. I mean, we got it, by the way, Jeremiah, super long book. Hats off to Baruch for writing this down, including Lamentations, right? Because Lamentations is of Jeremiah also. So hats off to Baruch for, for uh, the labor of love that he was involved in in providing the text of Jeremiah. So it's interesting, when we come to chapter 36 and we run across Jehoiakim, word gets to Jehoiakim, uh, who is uh, king of Judah. Jeremiah has produced a new work. And, and the whole process, I mean, Baruch had read the, the scroll that had been produced at Jeremiah's dictation in front of people. And then uh, one of the messengers brought it to the king's attention. The king said, all right, bring it in here. And so as the messenger is reading the scroll, what would happen is Jehoiakim would take his pen knife and after three or four columns had been read, he would cut it off and there were, it was wintertime and there was a fire pot going to keep the place warm, and he would take those three four columns and just toss it in the fire. What? This is Jehoiakim playing fast and loose with the Word of God. 
He is offended by the Word of God. And so what does he do? Cuts it out and throws it in the fire. I don't like it. I'm just going to get rid of it, right? As if somehow, you know, it's like a, it's like a little kid, right? When, he, when they like you play hide and seek with them and they cover their eyes, and, you know, and where are you, right? They think they can't, you, you can't see them because they can't see you, right? And that's, that's, that's an illustration of humanity in rebellion when we're just like, God can't see me if I can't see him, right? So I'm just going to throw his word in the, in the fire. I'm going to throw scripture in the fire. The thing is, Jehoiakim missed the fact that, yes, uh, our God is a consuming fire. His word is a burning fire. And uh, it's not good when you try and throw that fire in the fire. Uh, indeed, it does not turn out for him. This is the war on the word of God. Uh, just in its naked deformity. There has been a long-standing war on God's Word. It started even before the Bible was even written. It was all the way back to the Garden of Eden. All the way back to Satan. Remember, Adam and Eve, they had God's Word. No, you can eat of any tree, just don't eat of the one. And it's Satan who starts off this hot war in asking, did God really say... Jehoiakim is just a contemporary of Jeremiah who is the, uh, the contemporaneous example of the war on God's Word. The war continues today, brothers and sisters. Uh, maybe in some cases where there are those who literally take a pen knife and they just get rid of the parts that they don't want, uh, there have been those uh, even in our American history who've done that. But maybe it's not literally you know, cutting out portions, but figuratively taking away from God's Word by redefining terms uh, or by re-envisioning Scripture. That's a big one. That's a big phrase today. Re-envisioning Scripture. Re-envisioning God. Um, the, the war continues, and we need to be aware of that. Uh, that there are still these Jehoiakims who are running around trying to get rid of the burning fire of God's Word. But we know that there is a living power in God's Word and that living power of the Word of God, it, it kindles and it ignites within the souls of people. This is what Jeremiah was talking about in chapter 20 and verse 9, about how it's this burning fire shut up in my bones, in my heart, right? Um, one reason that I think uh, many Christians take a pass on outreach and evangelism or practice the Passover, if you will, on outreach and evangelism is because, uh, well, maybe we think we'll fail, right? However we define failure, right? Or, I think what happens is we've tried it in the past, but based on previous experience, we look back and we think about how after we were done sharing with somebody, you have those moments where you're like, ah, man, oh, I should have said that, right? Uh, oh, I forgot to mention. Oh, no. And, and what that betrays is a faulty notion on our part that we think we're the ones holding the evangelism boat together, that it's all dependent upon us, that we have to figure out this Rubik's cube of, cube of evangelism and say everything in just the right words, and if we just say things the right way, then bring, we've solved the Rubik's cube, we've unlocked the doors, and now we can... I don't know, people finally, you know, now they're going to come in, right? Siblings, brothers and sisters, the power is not in us. The power is not in how clever we are. It is not in how well spoken we come off. It is not in, well, if I can just say the right words. No, the, the power, the power is in the Word. The power is right here in God's Word. This is what is living and active. This is what is the burning fire that ignites people's souls. And so, it, it can't be contained. And it should not be contained. It cannot be kept in our bones. And all that is required is for us to faithfully unleash the Word into the world. And, and, and just because you get done and, and you, you're driving down the road or you're going home and you're, oh, oh I forgot to... I, I should have said, and we need to have faith that God is big enough, that He is stronger than I, and that He is capable of taking our meager efforts and multiplying them greatly for His kingdom. The power 
is in the Word. It's not in us. One more thing. And, and this does have to do with that new covenant that's mentioned there in Jeremiah 31. One of the interesting aspects of this, and there's a lot of ink that is devoted to this topic, is that God says in Jeremiah 31, 31, I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Uh, and uh, we are told here uh, also, <clears throat> excuse me, also that uh, God is going to unite His people. There will be a single uh, people, just one united people uh, of God. And and so again, a lot is made about that. See, God may He's going to make the covenant with the Jewish people. So what what does that do with the non-Jew, the Gentiles, right? Well, elsewhere in Jeremiah, we and by the way, previous to Jeremiah 31, you have already had a, a clear accounting for not just the Jewish folks, but the Gentile folks, the non-Jewish folks as well. And this goes back to chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, where you read that if uh, God speaking here, if you return, O Israel, declares Yahweh, to me, to me you should return. If you remove your detestable things from my presence and do not waver, by the way, detestable things, that would be idols. So get rid of the idolatry. And if you swear, as Yahweh lives in truth and justice and righteousness, then, notice, nations shall bless themselves in Him, in Yahweh, and in Him they shall glory. So notice, this is the nations, and this would be the non-Jewish people, the Gentiles, who are the ones who are blessing themselves in Yahweh and are bringing glory to Yahweh. Now we see the international scope of the work of God uh, among uh, and in the world. There's also a very familiar uh, illustration that's used in Jeremiah 16.16 16, where uh, God says, Behold, I am sending for many fishers, declares Yahweh, and they shall catch them. And, I mean, can you hear Jesus echoing here, right? Well, it just It's a hundred, several hundred years down the road, but Jesus is going to talk about it. He's going to call people to be fishers of men, yes? Well, this is, this is the prophetic background for that. And when God does this, He's going to bring many people from many different lands, many different nations, to the land, and He's going to restore the fortunes of all the people. All of this factors into, I believe, how we are to understand Jeremiah 31.31, and this new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. That it is intended to, yes, start with the, the people of God, the Jews, the Jews first, but then also it goes to the Gentiles, to the Greeks. Paul, Rabbi Paul, understood this. The Jew first and also to the Greek. And so those who follow Christ, regardless of ethnicity, they will be part, and, and they are part, of the new covenant people of God. And so when this phrase, new covenant, is picked up by Jesus uh, on the, uh, the night He's betrayed during the institution of the Lord's Supper, uh, Lord's Supper in Luke 22, verse 20, He says, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in My blood. There it is. There, that's the new covenant that Yahweh incarnate is making or cutting with His people, and then the church becomes that one new man created by Christ through His death on the cross. And again, Paul picks up on this in Ephesians 2. Quickly, I want to look at how this text, Jeremiah 31.31, 31, is used in the book of Hebrews. I don't have time to uh, spend uh, on chapter 8. Come with me to chapter 10 of the book of Hebrews. And just notice here how the writer of Hebrews uses it. Uh, we pick up the reading in Hebrews 10 and verse 11. Every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. That's what took place at the temple, in other words. All those sacrifices, year in, year out, day in, day out. But when Christ had offered for all time, in perpetuity, 
a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting for that time until his enemy should be made a footstool for his feet. That is an allusion, not a direct quote, but an allusion to Psalm 110. Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool. And, and so that's what is being referenced there in verses 12 and 13. 4, verse 14. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Notice, those whom God Himself makes the new covenant with are those who are being sanctified. And the way this is written in the original language, it shows that this is an ongoing process. Sanctification is, because it's a present tense thing, it's ongoing. But also, it is God who is the active agent in sanctification. It is God Himself who is the one who sanctifies us because this is what's called a passive voice verb. But it is by the single offering of Christ on the cross that those who are being sanctified are perfected for all time. That single offering is Christ on the cross. Now, proof of the sanctification of the people of God and proof of the perfect pardon of their sins is demonstrated by quoting from Jeremiah 31. Verse 15. And the Holy Spirit also bears witness or testifies to us. For after saying, this is the covenant that I will make with them, after those days, declares the Lord, I will put my laws in their hearts and write them on their minds. Then he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. You see, those who are being sanctified by God, they are the ones who have the law of God written on their hearts, and it's God Himself who writes the laws on their hearts and on their minds. And we notice, by the way, the means whereby God does this is His law. It's His Word. Uh, my laws are uh, what's written on their hearts, and that's what's going to sanctify the people. And then, those who God perfects and continues to perfect by that single offering of Christ on the cross, they are the ones whose sins and lawless deeds God remembers no more. Uh, their, their sins are forgotten by God, washed away by the blood of Christ, forgiven by His blood. And then one more thing. Notice again verse 15. The Holy Spirit testifies. Whatever was written in Scripture, and that would include the prophet Jeremiah, was spoken by the Holy Spirit. Notice, the Holy Spirit bears witness, testifies to us. Wait, you're quoting from Jeremiah 31. That took place several centuries prior to these first century Christians. Yep. And the Holy Spirit is still speaking to us. How can that be? It's the nature of the Word. Many books, many, many books are written in this world, but there are none like this one. This is the only thing that is God-breathed. Like if you put your hand right up close to your mouth and you talk and you can feel the breath on your fingers. That's this. And that's why, and it's all over the book of Hebrews, all over the New Testament. The Scriptures continue to speak. They continue to bear witness. And it's the Holy Spirit Himself. Everything written is spoken to us. It is the immediate Word of God, the Holy Spirit. And it continues to speak to us today through the text of Scripture that we have. And so this is, again, and much more could be said about the book of Jeremiah, but this is what the book of Jeremiah teaches us. What Jeremiah was pointing to, fulfilled in Christ through the cross and the sanctification that is ongoing in the church as people continue to be sanctified and set apart by God. Let's commit this to prayer and then we'll have a final word. <clears throat> You, O oh Lord, are a consuming fire burning eternally and continually. Your Word is in our bones. It's in our hearts, Father. May we recognize we cannot contain it. And may we share it with others. And may we stand upon the rich prophetic heritage of Jeremiah and stand faithfully and proclaim faithfully Your Word even though it may cost us uh, verbal abuse, uh, maybe even physical abuse. We... Surrender ourselves to You. You are stronger than us. You have prevailed. And we praise You for that. 
and you are to be glorified and magnified for it. Lord God, we thank you for Jeremiah. We thank you for his life and for his word, which is really your word to us. We pray all of this through Christ our Lord. Amen.